This podcast contains material that is intended for mature audiences and may not be suitable for all listeners. Enjoy. I don't want to get on the bandwagon. I'll burn that wagon down and join the band. Traveling troubadours, terrorizing street corners just to try to get some supper in our hands. Now I waited all my life to get this off my chest screen, buddy murder until someone understands that it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women. I make this noise just because I can. And we'll all join in to that original sin. So let's get rowdy and reckless. Let's get rowdy and reckless. Hello and welcome to Old Man Strength, a podcast of the Tailgate Society and brought to you by Deadeye Barbecue Sauce, the best damn barbecue sauce in the known universe. I am Tim Johnson, joined by Chris Shipley. Chris, how are we doing today? We're doing great. Excellent. Well, for those of you that are back joining us, you may notice we have done a slight rebrand of this podcast. The idea behind this is that Chris and I have a wealth of lived experience in what not to do, and we would like to go ahead and help everyone else understand what they ought to do. Um, Chris, is that a, a fair way to summarize what we're doing? It's a fair way, I would say. Right. We're taking all of our experiences and all of our dumb mistakes and great conquests and wrapping them all up into about an hour talk and see if we can't solve some world's problems. Yeah, absolutely. Because we looked out there and we said, you know, there's a lot of things wrong in the world. Uh, Why can't they be solved by a podcast? And who better to have a podcast and solve the world's problems than that underserved demographic of old white men? Uh, So I I feel like, uh, I feel like unfortunately, that demographic is undersold right now by the <laughs> representatives that we have out there. It's kind of hard to get lumped in with those people. Of, of old white men. Okay. Right. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, tell me a little bit about how your week is going. Oh, it's uh, it's been pretty crazy. Let's see. Let's review. Uh, Iowa State lost. Yeah. Hakeem Butler got cut and is not on a team. I can't figure that out. Very confusing. Uh, had uh, had a little bit of a shakeup in uh, in a career and uh, kind of at a little crossroads, but I think we're we're on the right path. So a plethora of things have gone on with me for the last couple of weeks. How about you, Tim? Uh yeah. So the big thing for me is that my daughter has started distance lear- learning. Uh, I have put my career on hold to be able to manage her distance learning because despite the fact that she still is affiliated with the school district, she spends exactly 50 minutes a day with an actual educator from that school district, and I'm responsible for facilitating the rest of that. Uh, I am not an early childhood educator. Listening in on the meetings that the teacher does have with these five and six year olds has reminded me why I'm not an early childhood educator. (laughs) Uh, And I am sorry, Easton, that your cat uh, ran away a couple years ago. I don't know what that has to do with the color of the day, which is blue. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, that's kind of been my big thing. Um, you know, one thing that that we we kind of talked on, uh, you know, touched on, is me putting my career on hold. You going through some changes. Even talking about Hakeem Butler, someone who went through college, got drafted into the NFL, signed a contract, thought he was going to be able to do something with his life, has now been uh, asked to take you know a sharp left turn. A lot of people in this pandemic have found themselves doing things they didn't expect. I think kind of a sharp left turn in life has been a big theme of 2020. Um, But honestly, uh, for you, Chris, and for me, that's not really a new theme, right? No, not at all. 
Uh, things are, are crazy right now, for sure. And uh, I don't know that a year ago, you know, I look at my Facebook memories that come up or whatever, and I look at tailgate photos or or photos of, you know, vacations or whatever. And, I, you know, there's no way a year ago I would envision where things would be right now as far as working exclusively from home, at one point having my daughter back from college and working here and my oldest here working here because she had lost a job and we had had six people in our house all trying to work and go to school and things like that. You just would never know. But you also develop that roll with the punches mentality as you gather a lot of experience in life that you tend to try to roll with that. Right. I think, yeah. uh, you, you know, you talk about you being on the other end of, uh, virtual learning and, and, and your, your daughter. Right. Mm-hmm. And I go upstairs and see my wife who is a, uh, early educator, early mm-hmm. elementary educator, um, you know, doing everything she can to do the best for those kids um, that are living in houses sometimes that, that don't have a father like you that Mm -hmm. has the ability to take care of their, uh, to to quit their job or to, to uh, put a hold on a career or whatever. Uh, They live in an impoverished neighborhood. They don't have internet access, all those things. Sometimes those kids, that's the only decent meal they get is when they get to go to school. Oh, so, sure. and I remember I walked up there and uh, I think it was Monday because Des Moines Public Schools just went back to uh, to online learning just on the 8th. That was the first day that they had classes mm-hmm. and the amount of excitement that those kids had when they got to see Mrs. Shipley on the screen was just, you know, you just realize that those kids have kind of gone through a lot as well. And they're probably going to be just as resilient as we are, because I, I think sometimes kids are really resistant. I think sometimes that the adults are the ones that freak out about stuff because they're so afraid of failure and not sure what they're going to do. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good point. You know, one conversation that my daughter's mother and I have had uh, is obviously this is not the ideal way to start kindergarten, right? And and she and I can both look back at our kindergarten experiences twenty four years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, 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 boy, I said 21st July. It's I don't know that I could remember that. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I even mumbled the wrong decade. God. Okay. Anyway, um, <laughs> but thinking back to that and, and, you know, one, one conversation or one point, I guess I made in that conversation, uh, to, to, uh, my daughter's mother was look, every kid her age, all of her peers are going through this right now. It's not like she is going through something unique. Yeah, it's unique from our perspective, but in relation to her peers, they're all going through it together. So in a year from now, six months from now, whenever we get through this and they're back through this, it's not like she's going to be at a relative disadvantage because they're all going through this together. And like you said, they are resilient and they are figuring this out. You know, my daughter's sad that she doesn't get to see her friends, but she still sees, sees kids she recognizes over you know, on, on the Google meet and she is learning how to adjust with this. And so for us to feel like, man, we're shortchanging, uh, our daughter. And, and I do feel like, you know, she's not getting the experience she should, but I also have to remember, I'm trying to look at it through the lens of what I went through and she doesn't even have that perspective. So she's not even feeling, she's not missing out on what I think she's missing out on, you know? Right. No, I, yeah. And, and I think if you look at, uh, just even back when you, when you were in kindergarten, those, you know, long, long time ago, uh, some of the things that you experienced are not something that they would ever, ever in their life have to experience. Right. Yeah. Uh, I, I can remember coming home after kindergarten and being in the house by myself. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, there's no way that that would ever happen now. There's no um, latchkey kids now compared to, no. to what we went through, right? I yeah. no. We watched. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen Stranger Things on Netflix. Oh yeah, which course. is set in the eighties, right? Right in the wheelhouse. I was probably the age of those kids at that time in the mid eighties yeah. or whatever, and I was watching it with uh, with my daughter Caitlin, and she she paused the thing, and she's like, "I gotta stop for a second. She's like, "It's ten o'clock at night. 
they're riding around on their bikes. Their parents aren't freaking out. What's going on? I was like, that was just <laughs> like, yeah, I can remember going and riding my bike. And yeah. it was, you know, the streetlights were on. My parents, you know, that was the rule. You got home and the streetlights were on. And if I didn't, I was going to, I was going to my buddy Scott's house and I was staying there. And, and I, that's just the way it was. And it's so completely foreign to her that that was even a possibility. And she'd be like, well, how did, how did they know where you were? Well, they didn't really know. Yeah. I, you know, they I didn't really thinking, know. I was thinking the other day uh, it got brought up. So I've recently had someone that I grew up with that moved away in like fourth grade or whatever. And, and he, I think he actually uh, teaches in, in the Des Moines area. Uh, he, Funnily enough, I actually uh, had inadvertently signed up for like his badminton class when I was a senior at Iowa State, and then didn't need the credit, so I dropped it. Uh, how did but, you? How did you get into that class? Because I, I always every year I tried to get into the golf class, and I could never get into that class. It was always full. Oh, I I was always lucky enough that I was I was credits ahead. Uh, I did not have to sweat graduating though, Chris. So it made a different, uh, kind of experience. <laughs> we did, we did, <laughs> we did. I sweated it. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I was thinking uh, it got brought up. You know, uh, we used to go play hide and seek around the neighborhood after dark, and I remember uh, coming inside when we had decided we were going to play hide and seek, and my mom uh, actively saying, "Oh, let me make sure all of your dark clothes are washed so that you can go play hide and seek with black." <laughs> clothes in the right. dark in the neighborhood whereas you know that same woman my mother now if i let my daughter go outside in the middle of daylight not yes. wearing like, a reflective orange vest would probably right. freak out so yeah it's definitely a different time you know we didn't have internet growing up right so oh no these kids didn't have didn't have to do distance learning it wouldn't have been an option for us like this we didn't have tablets where we could talk to our teacher and see our friends and do all these things that wasn't that wasn't a thing at all it, you were lucky if you had you know a, a decent typewriter in your house it's just it's just a different world yeah it, it is and you you look back and you think now how how would this have happened in 1980 seven right the 88 right i'm i'm a senior in high school and and this was to happen how would they handle that like it's it's mind-boggling that the time parameter of those things that mm. of how what would they do yeah right they i i think that i think that there'd be a lot of things different i think it, it was a different time back then so i think that the thoughts of everybody wearing masks and everybody you know practicing social distancing and so on, I think would have been followed much more. Sure. I think I mean, because we, there we, wasn't, because there wasn't a choice, right? There really wasn't a choice. You, you were going to school and you were going to follow these rules and so on and so on. And you know, we were coming, we were coming out of that cold war era doing air raids and, you know, nuclear attack drills in our schools where we were just used to doing things that probably weren't likely to, to ever happen. Like, like, Iowa was really going to be the subject of a nuclear bomb. Right. And, and like huddling with our hands over our head underneath the desk was going to do anything about it. <laughs> but we were still in that era where we were used to uh, just living in this kind of period of the shit could hit the fan at any moment. So, yeah, we probably would have been way more compliant on masks and distancing and rules like that. And I, and I think we were bred that way, right? We, yeah. We grew up in an era where you were scared of certain things. Oh yeah. You were, you know, you were scared of, uh, uh, of communism and of nuclear war and the end of the world. I mean, those were those were real threats back Absolutely. then as a kid growing up. Uh, and but then you know it's funny how things completely flip, right? I can remember, I can remember vividly when Johnny Gosh got kidnapped. Here in Des Moines, he mm -hmm. was around the same age as I was. I delivered newspapers. Boy, that was the end of that. Once yeah. once that happened, that was the end of that for my dad. And and you look back now and you think, 
there's no way I'd let my 12 year old kid be in the middle of the night right now delivering oh, yeah. papers at four o'clock in the morning. There's no way I would be okay with that. But yeah. it was perfectly acceptable back then. Yeah, it's so it's it's different to to sometimes it's almost easy to forget how much things are 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 uh, radically different, how much they've changed. And so I, you know, I know me as a parent. Um, it, I have to remind myself that I can't compare my daughter's experience to my experience. Uh, but I also had this conversation recently with my sister. So uh, my sister has uh, a son in college at Iowa State and one who is a senior in high school right now. And I asked her uh, what that one who was a senior in high school, because he's he's a really good athlete. He's a top 10 rated runner uh, in the state of Iowa right now in cross country. He's probably going to be getting some decent scholarship offers or grant offers to, to go run at school. But I asked, um, what does he want to do? Because he has a really, you know, kind of charismatic personality, but not necessarily a clear driven aptitude towards one subject or another. Um, which for, for him is very different than his older brother. His older brother is very much like uh, his dad, who's been in the same career for 25 years or whatever, like has known what he's going to do has maybe changed offices, you know, companies three or four times, but done the exact same thing for, forever and i think i think my nephew's older brother is very much like that but uh what i'm talking about is very much like me where i'm sitting here asking her what does he want to do and what does he think he's going to be coming out of high school right and so that kind of leads me into i guess my first question for you because i think i have a good idea on where you're going or how you're going to answer this um or at least what direction you're going to go into. Uh, what did you think you were going to be when you were, let's go back to 1987, eight, 1988, you're getting done with high school. What did you think you were going to do? What if, 1988, Chris Shipley, what 19, are you going to be when you grow up? Here's, here's what's crazy. Uh, 1988, I remember I watched a movie uh, called Secret of My Success that had Michael J. Fox in it. Oh, yeah, of course. We and he was going to make it. Right? And he was going to go to this this big firm in New York and just make it big and be rich and be an executive and so on. And I was like, that's, that's something that I want to do, right? Like, I just want to be like a boss in a big office, as crazy as that sounds, and, and, and like in an advertisement firm or something like that. I was obsessed with with like pitching ideas and, and, and advertisement firms. Oh, wait, oh everyone and, does. I, I, right. think, I, I think. Cause we all. Was, right. We, we all. Success, uh, big. Like it was yes. huge back in the eighties to be right. like, Oh no, we can just find ways where you pitch fun ideas. We all right. need ideas as kids. And you we all thought and you pitch neat ideas. Yeah. We all thought we were created. You yeah, know? exactly. So, uh, that was my, that was my early forms of what I thought would would be like a, a an amazing career and um so i remember graduating from high school uh and i remember uh my dad telling or i i told my dad that i wanted to become a business major that was you know and i figured that was wide enough to know you know to start and then i could find a, a, a you know a place to go and there and at the time he was running his um his business mm -hmm. uh, he had just started he had just opened up a little wholesale business and was doing it on his own. And as we've talked before, my dad was kind of a hustler. He, you know, he hustled his entire life. And I, and I remember him saying to me, uh, he said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. He said, uh, you go to college and, and, and learn how to run a business and then I'll show you how to make money. Yeah. And I was like, okay, well, you know, and, and at the time I'm like, whatever, old man, <laughs> I, you know, I, I got these big, I got these big dreams, you know? And, uh, so I went to college and, uh, it wasn't, uh, I'll tell you what, I, I've said it a hundred times. High school does not prepare you for college. 
No, no, not at all. Because the minute you get up there, those people do not care whether you show up to class or anything else. You're on your own. And the and the big the big response the big thing that got punched me in the face was personal responsibility. Yeah. Absolutely. So uh, yeah. Absolutely. It's it is great to know that you don't have to go to class and no one's going to get mad at you. Uh but then you learn, oh shit, that's why everyone wanted me to go to class before, because I am screwed if I don't right. go to class enough. You right? fool you know, yourself. Some... You fool yeah. yourself sometimes into thinking that I can make it up. I can yeah. make it up. Yep. And that that it's like a rolling boulder down a hill and eventually you just you you lose it. You can't you can't catch up. Yeah. And I mean I will say that there are some ways that that does also teach you some good aspects of picking and choosing, right? You know, um I am a firm believer in a in a well-rounded education. You know, one thing talking back to the conversation I had with my sister as I said that my nephew would probably benefit most from a well-rounded education, exposure to a lot of things. Don't lock himself into one major right away. Make sure that she knows that she should be comfortable with him changing his major three, four, or five times because he's going to, to probably change his career three, four, or five times in the first six years of his career anyway. Um, but at the same time, you also learn uh, how to play to your strengths. So maybe it's actually okay that you don't go to that class all the time because it's not worth your energy and efforts. And unless you're going on to like grad school or professional school where you need to have that high GPA, if, if you're pretty certain that you're going to get your bachelor's degree or your social degree and you're going to be done, uh, I've never been asked uh, what my GPA was on a professional interview. Right. The only no. time I think it would ever matter. And I even I guess I was asked when I went to grad school because I went to grad school. And then when I went to grad school, no one I, I had a better GPA in grad school than I did in undergrad. And no one has ever asked me what my GPA was in grad school either. So. But do you think that that was probably because you were more at that point in tune to what you wanted to do? And then you saw like an end goal. Right. Yeah. Like that's, yeah. That's yes. how I was later later on in college. Once I finally got my footing of what I knew I wanted to accomplish, that's when I started to buckle down and really focus on that. And, that and, your, I and, think, your, and your goal at that point was to graduate. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I it was a long winding road there. There was a lot of bumps and hills there. But, you know, I – well, you know, we'll, we'll just be honest about it. I, I – I completely jacked around my first semester there, wasted and and looking back at, at older, r ruined a, a really good opportunity, and and did a disservice to my parents. Right, they oh, yeah. were paying for it out of their own pocket, and and uh, you know I I got two semesters in of just not going to class and and partying and and doing things that I shouldn't have been doing, and. Uh, you know, walking into that house of my dad's and telling him that I had to leave school was the hardest thing that I had ever done. Yeah. Oh, but sure. I will tell you to this day, and that was, it was 26 years ago, 27 years ago, I wouldn't be the man I am today if that wouldn't have happened to me. Yeah. Because well, yeah, something sure. something changed with me where I had decided I wasn't going to take anybody's help anymore. And I was going to do it on my own. And if I made my failures or if I made my accomplishments, it was all on my own. I wasn't going to blame anybody else and nobody else was going to get any credit. And that's, yeah, I, that's kind know, of how I, so to, you know, I tell my kids all the time. Yeah. I, I, I messed up and I, and I did some really stupid shit, but I'm the man I am today because of that. And I wouldn't change it. Yeah. You know, I, I have a kind of a, a different, um, a little different story. My my folks both went to Iowa State ahead of me. Um, and it's not that they weren't of the means to fund my education, but they were both the first one in their fa in their families. They were first generation college students, and they, you know, my my mom's parents dropped her off the first day of school and said, "We'll see you at Christmas." Right. So, like, she had no kind of interaction whatsoever. And so my folks 
provided a lot of things for me along the way in college, but they said tuition is up to you, right? So, you know, they let me know in high school. And high school, I say this with all humility, high school was, was kind of easy for me, so I took it for granted. Um, but knowing, you know, that I had to get scholarships, or once I got to college, I had to maintain or get new scholarships. Um you know, I had to go do work study at the library, some of those things. I didn't have it as easy as my folks did. I remember, you know, my dad worked three jobs uh, when he was at Iowa State, and and, and I didn't. But realizing that uh, any success or failure I had at college, well, that was now on my shoulders. And I had to deal with the consequences of that and realize, okay, well, if I'm paying for this, I better try to get through here as efficiently as possible, not find myself having to pay, in, uh, you know, another semester of tuition that I needed to, um, not having to retake classes that, you know, just becomes a waste of your money to have to retake a class. Uh, and so, yeah, it definitely, it definitely forces you, uh, to, uh, kind of reconsider your approach and sometimes you have to you have to go through something where you're failing out of school or you're not as successful as you think because you're just kind of used to uh the life that you had that certain level of whether you want to call it privilege or just knowing that you're able that you're going to be able to take advantage of what is already out there and now that you're faced with the consequences of those actions it really does force you to reevaluate what you think you're going to do and who you're going to be. Yeah. I, I, uh, I look back at, at, at that. And as I said before, I, I don't, uh, I don't regret that at all. Uh, once I got through that portion and rededicated things, I was more on a straight line. Uh, my, my schoolwork improved. Uh, you know, that there's a big difference. My priorities changed a hundred percent. The minute that I, that I left Iowa state, uh, I went to DMAC for two semesters to get my grades in order. I, I mm. took, I took DMAC classes and worked full time. And then I worked, I worked every day at principal, uh, and went to school full time in Ames and drove back and forth from Des Moines every day to go mm -hmm. to school Ames and graduated. And then at that point, I began working for my dad and uh, I met my first wife and, uh, and I had, I had kind of a, a decision to make, right? I, uh, I, I had a new wife. I just graduated with a political science degree. I had every intention of going to law school. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my, that was at that point that the, the, the tunnel that I'd saw, I wanted to be a lawyer. And uh, I just, so I, I, I made a decision to, 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 to go work for my dad and help my dad build his business and raise my family and put that dream on hold. Yeah. So let's, let's back up here a second. So coming out of high school, I asked you what 1988 Chris thought he was going to be, and he was going to be businessman, like, like right. not really a clear idea, but right. like that's, that I uh, wanted a big corner office. Right. And a secretary, that's what I wanted. And I that, just I wear a suit that, every day. Doesn't that sound terrible? That sounds right, like terrible the guy now. wears a suit but still has sneakers he puts up on his desk. Uh, right. <laughs> right. Right. Um so so you you went into college thinking uh business. And then somewhere along the way, like you've mentioned last podcast that you went into political science because that's where you were kind of the closest to getting a degree. Yep. But also probably along that way is where you thought maybe uh, attorney. So what, what happened while you were in college, uh, you know, before you graduated and changed your mind again, but what well, happened to, to change you from, from business to attorney? I, I, I took a business law class. It was one of my electives that I had to take uh, for political science. Mm -hmm. uh, I was fascinated with it. Mm -hmm. um, I had always uh, been enamored with the thought of defending people that needed help. Mm -hmm. And 
that was it. And, and, and you know, I, I jokingly say, you know, what's the closest major I was closest to? Political science was it. But I was very heavily in love with history and politics and and the law. And, and it just seemed like a good fit for me. And when I saw that a political science degree could then lead me into that profession, uh, that's what I wanted to do. I, I, I had, you know, a crazy idea of, of being a public defender because I sure. thought that there was a need for people that need help. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, by the way, I think it's funny that it was business law that got you there, since that's like the most <laughs> opposite of public defender. The last people who need a I, public defender. I know, right? That's <laughs> but but it was just the nuances of loopholes and contracts and 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 who, and, and who and, the law and, works for and how it works. Right? Yeah. The and, machinations of it all. Right, and it was just intriguing to me, and and probably a little bit of of starstruck right again of the the idea of uh, of being a lawyer and and all the glamour that usually goes with it you know what i mean you were um, a huge although, corbin bernson fan and i was a lot of yeah, like a lot. yeah exactly. right right more of a jimmy smith's guy i was more of a jimmy smith's guy he was <laughs> but uh so that i but that that dream got put on hold so you know, it's funny how your career takes twists and turns. I ended up working for my dad. Uh, he had a small little uh, wholesale business that he would just he there for a while. He would just he would ha sell stuff at flea markets, right? Mm -hmm. And just buy and sell stuff and whatever. And that's where I learned how to 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 make deals and to 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 really talk to people and have conversations with people. Um, he ended up. He had no intention ever of opening a store, uh, first of all, because he didn't have the temperament for it. He was a terrible customer service person. <laughs> His disposition was terrible. I'm not, I'm not sure how he, but he uh, he got started by, he in Waterloo, Iowa, they used to have a return center for uh, Home Shopping Network. Oh, sure. And he went up there and he, this guy was trying to sell him, he could go in there and buy all these returns. And this guy just kept telling kept trying to sell him these computers and my dad was like i don't know a damn thing about those things and and but dad said I'll, you know i'll buy them and and i'll i don't know i'll see what i can do so he, he came home i think he had 20 of them he put an ad in the paper and in two days he had sold every one of them yeah and in in, in his words he's like so needless to say i got in the fucking truck and went back up there and got some more <laughs> <laughs> so he ended up opening a little computer store uh -huh. and i was working there and finishing college uh, I was selling stuff and kind of running the store for him. And we had a guy in the back that, uh, that did all the tech work. And, um, I mean, well, it's just crazy. Uh, he, we, we got, we, at one point we had two stores in Des Moines. We were selling used computers and building new ones. I didn't know a thing about a computer. I couldn't, I knew how to use them. I didn't have any idea how they worked. Uh, but I could sell them. I was a good salesman. I was a good, uh, I was very good at, at talking to people and customer service and, and uh, I ended up, uh, the guy that was running the, the back uh, of the tech part quit, had a falling out with my dad. And my dad was like, well, what do we do? He's like, because I don't know anything and you don't know anything. And the guy had, the guy had kind of <laughs> did a number on us. He had stole a few things or whatever. So, you know, we were a little leery about hiring anybody else. And I said, you know what? Fuck it. Let's just keep going and I'll go back there and I'll figure it out. Yeah. And I seriously, from that point on, self-taught myself how to work on computers. Yeah, well, and, well so I think uh, that whole idea, I, first of all, I want to give credit to your dad, right? So we see a lot of, you know, 10 years ago, you saw this kind of marketplace where people were like buying and selling things on eBay and they had their eBay stores and they were able to make things work there. Uh, I've talked recently with people as I've been trying to figure out kind of a, a side gig or a, or a way to get a little bit, you know, more passive, less active income with people right now that are Amazon sellers. And I've kind of learned about how cutthroat that is, where people are willing to give me advice, but they don't want to tell me what their their Amazon store is because it's that cutthroat that they, they want to do that. Um, but all of those things kind of come with uh, – 
you know, certain safety nets. Uh, what your dad did with um, just buying computers without any clue what was going on, that was a huge risk, right? Like, if you think about it, he didn't know what he was doing. And in order to get that inventory, he had to invest capital that he did not know he was going to get a return on. Yeah. And, and that is absolutely huge. But but Com- that that taught you something, right? Cu- coupled with the fact that he didn't have a real job. Yeah. Uh, and he was paying a mortgage and yeah. and and you know, lights and utilities and, and everything else out of his house. Uh but he just that was where I think that's where my work ethic of I won't ever quit came from. Yeah. And, I mean, it- and, and to be honest with you is probably what was so hard about at the end when he passed away, you know, with a lot of depression and things like that to see what kind of a shell of a man he was, which, you know, at, at some point we'll probably talk about in a future podcast. Sure. That, that's what they call in the business of tease, right, Tim? You know what they call that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, I, that's where I got it from and, yeah, I, and, and, and to watch him with an eighth grade education, just not ever quit was, was inspiring. That is probably the best lesson that I learned ever. It, it more than anything that I ever learned from a college degree. Right. It, it taught you how to uh, be willing to accept and take risk. It taught you how to, to take on something that you are not familiar with, but you're going to make work. Right, so you're gonna dive in feet first, and invest in yourself, because investing in yourself and taking the time to learn, you know, at least some. You know, your dad didn't ever become a computer expert, but he learned enough to be able to get these things to move and to get you involved, right? And so now yep. the next step is now you're taking this where you weren't, a, you know, you were a, a poli sci major, and then you got into sales and hustle. You talk about your dad as a hustler. What you learned is how to hustle, and part of how to hustle is teaching yourself new skills as you go, taking advantage of the resources you have to acquire new skills, not relying on college or expensive training or whatever to get you there, but realizing that in a lot of ways just out of necessity, right? The Part of that hustle is... I'm invested. I have to figure out a way to make this work. And so now you're going to go ahead and take what's available to you and learn this new skill. So you learned everything you can about computers just virtually out of necessity. And you were able to now take that and make that something else, right? Fear of failure is a huge motivator. Yeah. It's a huge motivator. And after walking in there and having to tell him that I failed at college, I, as I said before, I just wasn't ever going to do that again. I wasn't mm-hmm. ever going to say that again. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, at that point, we were like, we'll figure it out, Dad. I'll figure it out. Like, it can't be that hard. The guy that left did it. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I watched him enough that I could piece it together. Uh, and at the time, I, I there was a I, I read a lot of, of, at the time, before Google was – was you know forums and 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 message boards. I mean, yeah, I'd spend I'd, I'd spend a lot of hours in in Ask Jeeves. That was one of the first ever <laughs> one of the first ever search engines. Ask Jeeves web uh, crawler, yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, but that it, it all kind of ties together because that learning that with no professional education on it. And teaching myself how to do it was so beneficial later on in life because, mm-hmm. you know, we, we ran that store until about 2003 uh, after the Iraq war and the, and the recession and so on. And, and at that point, you know, you could buy a new computer for almost what you could buy a used one for. Mm-hmm. Um, and among some other things, you know, I, 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 a, a lot of listeners may, may know some of my story about Marty Terrell and, here in Des Moines, Iowa, and that whole story with my dad, but that was a big contributor to to, to the business closing. And uh, I remember my dad was holding on for the longest time, and he kept saying, holding on to the business, and he kept saying, well, I'm really worried about you, and I'm really worried about what you're going to do. And I was like, Dad, I'm 20-some years old. I can get a job anywhere. Yeah. You know, I'll work here as long as I can. I'll work here as long as you want me to. You know, there were months where I wouldn't take a paycheck. I couldn't take a paycheck. 
Um, but I just couldn't abandon him. I couldn't, you know, it was his dream to run this business. And, uh, and he, you know, he finally had to close and I ended up, um, I ended up going on unemployment, which I hated. I hated being paid for not working. Yeah. And, uh, I took a job as a inventory coordinator at, um, Slumberland's Furniture. Worst freaking decision of my life. And I hated that. <laughs> Everybody there was a complete jackass. They were so, so they were such jackholes. And I had, I had signed up for a temp agency for IT and I got this job and I didn't take this temp job. And so I remember I went home and I told my dad, I said, I can't, I can't work here. So this is a, it, it, I, it's a bad environment for me, but I, I don't want to quit. And he's like, well, you know, you, at some point you can't, you can't keep working and just be miserable. Mm -hmm. So I went home that day and my phone rang and it was a temp agency and they had a temporary placement at Wells Fargo on the help desk. And I was like, huh, I think I know somebody that works there. So I told him I would take it and I hung up the phone and I called my buddy Darren and I said, what place do you work at at Wells Fargo again? And he said, Oh, you work, I work at the, the help desk at technology connection. I go, shut up. I just got hired on there. So, like, you tie that in, right? Like, that was the day I decided to quit. I just happened to get a phone call from somebody that offered me a job at the same place that my buddy is there. So, I went and worked there. Now, my buddy Darren was like, you won't last five fucking minutes here. <laughs> and I was like, why? That He's thanks. like, because you ran your own business for so long. You can't tell people to go fuck themselves on the phone over here. You can't do that. <laughs> I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to say that to anybody on the phone. But, you know, uh, it was a help desk. It was basically a, a, a technology help desk. You would call in, you know, with issues on your computer, Wells Fargo. But do you know that the fact that I taught myself how to work on computers, it was easier for me to speak in those terms for those people to understand. Oh, sure. That I wasn't over talking. I wasn't talking over them over their head, right? Like, you I remember were, sitting there. with a lot of jargon. You were like, right. the, you, were, you could relate with they're the same idiot that doesn't know what's going on. I, and Yeah. I There was a guy sitting next to me, this young kid. I'll never forget this. And he's, he's we had to find out what, when they would call in, you'd have to find out what type of operating system was on the computer, whether it was Windows 95 or, or Windows 7. And he's over there and he's like, okay, I need you to go in the bottom left-hand corner and click this button. And then I need you to go here. And then I need you to right click on this and then go to this tab and then read to me the third line there in that code. What does it say? And I go, dude, just ask her if the start button is a square or a circle. <laughs> like, what are you fucking doing over there? Right? You know, like, like that's, yeah. And that's a good example of, I, old school kind of you just spent five minutes walking this poor person through this entire deal when yeah, the first thing you had to click on technical way to do it without realizing there's just a practical right right no absolutely um so we there's a lot actually that i kind of want to uh unpack here but why don't we go ahead and take a break we'll get a, a word from our sponsor and then we will go ahead and jump back in here because I have a lot of things I kind of want to ask you about not just um, how you transitioned to this this IT career. And then I also kind of want to get into the changes that you're you're going through now in your career. But I also kind of want to go back and, and uh, ask you a little bit more about uh, your dad because he was obviously a very large influence. And, and I've got some things that I, I want to kind of tease out there. But we'll go ahead and take it, uh, a little break. We'll grab a word from our sponsor, Dead Eye Barbecue Sauce. Again, the best damn barbecue sauce in the known universe. They have five new superfoods. Outs, uh, acai, dragon fruits, words I've not even heard of. Some fruits I think are only found in Middle Earth. I don't know all of these things. Uh, but we'll go ahead and let them have a word, and we will be back once again. This is Old Man Strength. Back when I started Dead Eye, I knew I wanted to innovate the barbecue game. Since day one, we've offered a premium barbecue product unlike anything else on the market. Great Aunt Irene had something special tucked away on a recipe card in her cupboard, and there was no way we weren't gonna do something about it. So we decided to take it one step further, introducing Deadeye Superfood Barbecue Sauce. We've got five new flavors, graviola, acerola, pink guava, acai, and dragon fruit. 
They're the first of its kind, and they're packed with flavor. Find it at your local grocer today or at DeadeyeBBQ.com. And we are back. Once again, this is Old Man Strength. I am Tim Johnson, joined by Chris Shipley. We are talking career changes, career development, understanding where you start out and where you end up and where you might be going sometimes is very different than any path you would have ever laid out for yourself or anyone would have laid out for you. Uh, Chris, when we left off, you were talking about how you made yourself into, despite uh, the, a political science degree and you know legal aspirations, and then just working, hustling in a resale shop, you, you made yourself into a viable IT candidate uh, through uh, what you learned at the shop and what you're able to parlay into an actual, uh, you know, I don't want to say legitimate, but actual, like, posted as uh, mm-hmm. an IT job. Uh, so let's pick up there. Tell me a little bit more about kind of what that first job was like and, and uh, how you're able to take that the, the skills you acquired through hustling uh, to, to actually parlay that into uh, a career. Yeah, I brought, uh, I got brought on uh, at Wells Fargo, uh, working in uh, the help desk, taking calls, and it was, uh, it was a call center. I mean, it was, it's a meat grinder. It, it's exactly what they. I always said Wells Fargo paid you to get you. They didn't necessarily pay you to keep you. Mm-hmm. They give you a shit ton of PTO. Uh, which I used every minute of it every year. I never carried any <laughs> over. Uh, uh, but you know that's that job was a, was a job to hustle at, right? You, I remember. Uh, I don't know. It was a week or two in. I was sitting. I, I luckily got sat next to a, a group of guys that were pretty good. Pretty good group of guys. One of them was the friend of mine that uh, that had already been there, and they kind of took me under their wing, and. Uh, this uh this guy his name is troy he um started off where i was and he ended up i don't know moving over into training and then became a site manager and so on but i remember he said they used to put uh, a piece of paper up a long piece of paper up on the wall when you walked in there and had everybody's name on it and how many calls you took and he said see that piece of paper over there my goal every week is to see my name at the top of that list because mm-hmm. i want to be recognized and i want you know, I want to know, I want people to know who I am. Yeah. And I was like, you know, that's, that's kind of brilliant, right? Like, uh, there's a fine line between just taking a call, taking a call, taking a call and helping people and and doing the best you can and so on. But it was so natural for me because I was just able to put it in simple terms for people and to, to walk them through. It's like that old movie, uh, Philadelphia, with mm-hmm. Denzel Washington when he's like, hold on, explain it to me like I'm a five-year-old. Like, that's kind of how I treated it. Because there were people that would call in there, and, they, I mean, they didn't have – they were there to sell mortgage loans. That was their yeah. job. Their job was not to use a computer, wasn't to learn how to hook up a printer. That's not what they were hired for. They were hired for their sales skills. So that's kind of how I ran with that, right? Yeah. Um, and I uh, I did that job uh, for a long time. It uh, sucked. It was not a fun job. You're on the calls. But I will tell you, I have probably three or four friends that I'm still like super great friends with today that work there that we can tell story after story after story of just the shit that we used to do sitting in those cubicles or whatever else. Like Mm -hmm. the time with those guys was fun, right? The job was just a meat grinder, man. It just, it was terrible. Um, I mean, it's like it's like um, any number of customer service jobs, really, right? Whether or not you're uh, just handling complaints to, like, you know, uh, a bartender or server. At the end of the day, your job there is to field uh, what people have problems with, provide a solution for them, and you're dealing with any number of of uh, you know. You don't want to say they're idiots, but at the time and what you're bonding over with your with your your coworkers, can you believe what this idiot did or said or or whatever? Right? Oh yeah, uh, uh, and you're also just realizing that, uh, man, some people are just going through life oblivious 
uh, and uh, for better or for worse, or whether or not you can empathize with them, there's still just some sort of camaraderie and team building with your coworkers over uh, sharing war stories, right? You you would you would hear it at least twice a day. We'd get off the phone, and some one of our buddies would go, "And that dude makes more money than me." <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I can you know, that guy's dumber than a box of rocks, and he makes more money than I do. But you know, when as I got into it, and and I was there longer, and my shift got a little better. I mean, at one point, I was working a six to two thirty shift. That was a cake. That was a cakewalk. I mean, you didn't take a call for the first two hours. I mean, you, you know, it was great. Uh, mm-hmm. And and then you again that whole hustling thing. You, you the longer you were there, I would I wouldn't have to take frontline calls. I would just help you know in the chat rooms or whatever else. And and you you start to train some people every once in a while or whatever you know. And I'll never forget. I had a guy sitting with me. Two stories. These are great stories. Guy sitting next to me. And this lady calls in, and I answered the phone. I said, thank you for calling Technology Connection. This is Chris Shipley. How can I help you today? And she goes, well, what do you know about this Star Wars thing? Like, that was the first thing out of her mouth. And I was like, <laughs> and it was right about the time that, that uh, Revenge of the Sith came out. And I was like, are you talking about the movie? And she's like, no, what are you, some kind of smart ass? And I was like, no, ma'am, I honestly don't know what you're talking about. And she goes, well, I, what I'm talking, didn't I just talk to you 10 minutes ago on the phone? And I was like, no, ma'am. She's like, well, are you sure? I was like, well, we have about 700 people that work on this help desk. So I don't know that it was me. And she's like, well, my computer makes a bunch of beeps and dings like Star Wars, on, like that droid <laughs> on Star Wars. And I muted my phone and I turned around and I was training some kid next to me. And I muted my phone and I go, I don't know what the fuck she's talking about. <laughs> and she goes... Well, I could just mute myself and not have to hear that or hear this. And I was like, oh, my God, did you? I'm like, did she just hear me say the F word? And I looked at my I said, is your mic on? And he goes, no. And I flipped the, the thing back on. And I said, I'm sorry, man, but I, I didn't quite hear what you said. And she goes, well, I could just mute my computer and not hear it. But I just didn't get it fixed. And I was like, I, my heart came out of my chest. I thought for sure I was fired or whatever. And But uh and then, you know, one time I overwrote some guy's mortgage data on his laptop. I was there maybe three weeks. And, you know, when you used to have the old tape drives and you'd have to throw them on the tape drive and then restore it. Yeah. And we had this, he, his laptop died and he had did a backup and he got his new laptop, but he didn't get his, his tape restore for another two weeks. So in those two weeks, he had already put loan data on his laptop. So I didn't know that. So I just had him slip the tape in and I and I had him click on restore and it overwrote two weeks worth of data. And instantly he was like, I want to talk to your manager. And I was like, oh, I'm fired. I've been here three weeks. Right. Yeah. I'm fired. Yeah. And Mike Dyer, who is a really good friend of mine, uh, he he came over and he's like, fuck that guy. <laughs> I, was like, he's, I was like, I said, well, I thought maybe I was going to get fired. And he's like, he looked at the guy next to me and goes, Darren. How many times have you overwritten somebody's data around here? <laughs> but, you know, you just, you kind of move along or whatever else. But yeah. that that job was a meat grinder. And I just, that's when you just kind of, you start to look at your life and go, I'm smarter than just resetting passwords here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm, I'm better, not better than that, but I, I'm at that time I was 30, 37, 38 years old. And I was like, I'm, I'm doing a, a call center job at 38 years old. Um, you know, it, it provides for my family, but you know, what am I, I'm smarter than this. Yeah. Right. I'm smarter than this. And, uh, so that transitioned into taking a job there, uh, with quality assurance. Mm-hmm. You ever done, you, you know what, you ever done quality assurance when you call into a call center and they say this call might be recorded for, Oh yeah. Right? so that, that was me. I would then listen to the calls and then grade them on their performance. And, sure. and my, my current sure. wife, who I was married to at the time when I took this job, she's like, don't you feel bad for marking people off for the shit that you used to do all the time? And I was like, <laughs> nope, not at all. It was like, it's, it's, it's a fair point, but the reality is, is you probably should have gotten written up for that stuff. Right? <laughs> and maybe I did, but <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, right. It, but you know, it's that, it's that old saying, you know, 
you're so good at doing that shit. Maybe you should start grading people and, you know, maybe you should just start <laughs> teaching them not to do that stuff. One of those right? deals or something. I don't right? know. Or maybe they just figured my performance was so terrible. Let's get him off the help desk and put his, <laughs> those put his can't evilness. Those can't teach. Yeah. Right. <laughs> put, the, put his evilness to good use here. So that's probably, probably what they thought, but. Uh, I did that for a little bit and then, uh, they decided to send that job over to the Philippines and I, I got laid off. Sure. Sure. Which, so, which unfortunately happens, uh, far too often. Um, I, when I was at, uh, the headquarters of Best Buy in the early two thousands, um, we, uh, outsourced and brought back at in-house and outsourced and brought back in-house, uh, portions of it, uh, probably four or five times in four or five years. I, I remember a woman I used to work with Ellen. Uh, so we used to have at, at Best Buy, you had a green badge. What was it? It was a yellow badge if you if you were a corporate employee, and a green badge if you were a contractor. And uh, throughout, from like two thousand three to two thousand seven, I think the color of her badge changed three times, and she had never even left her desk. <laughs> so the only thing that had changed, her job didn't change, her desk didn't change. Her computer didn't change. The extension at her uh, at her desk on her phone didn't change. The only thing that changed was the color of her badge, and it just went back and forth. And and the big challenge there is that she lost any type of uh, seniority or benefits or whatever. So you know, like oh, you know, after five years, you get two more days of vacation. Well, she didn't get that because she she, she hadn't been employed for five years. Mm-hmm. She had been. She'd been employed employed for ten years. But in in the eyes of Best Buy, she had been employed for six months. So, right, uh, yeah, that was definitely a thing. Where particularly, you know, back then, uh, IT was going through. There were a lot of ways to, you know, send something to the Philippines or to India or or elsewhere. Well, you know, it's funny that you say that because I I remember uh, being off and not sure what I, what I wanted to do, and I remember I was. I felt like I was getting more and more uh, like my dad. Like I, I, you know, I, the opportunity came to get that job back and they wanted to re-interview me back for the job. And I thought, and it was with the site manager, like this guy that runs the entire department. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. why is this guy doing these interviews? And I, and he called me on the interview and we were talking and I thought, you know what? I'm just, I'm too old for this fucking bullshit. You know, he asked me a question or something and and he said, Oh, his question was something to the effect of tell me why you think you'd be a good fit uh, back with this job, which is a bullshit interview question. Right. right? Like like, I I mean, I've done it already. I I said, I said, well, Phil, if you want the real truth, I was your top performer in that department and you shouldn't have fired me to begin with. Uh-huh. I mean, I just thought, what do I got to lose? Right. Yeah. I already don't have the job. Yeah. You know, my mom used to joke that my dad never wanted the job that he'd go look for a job and he'd walk into somebody's place and go, you're not really hiring. Are you? That was his way of not <laughs> wanting to get a job. Cause he was afraid they would say, yeah. And then he'd have to take a job. Right. So that was sure. kind of, I it channeled my inner Melvin there. And I was just like, well, frankly I should, you know, cause I figured I, if anything, I'm going to get this off my chest. Right. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and then the, the the hiring manager who I'd worked for before had called me, I don't know, 20 minutes after the call, after the interview. And she said, uh, what did you say to Phil? <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I told her and she goes, well, I don't know. But he called me and said, you should probably go hire that guy back. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's funny. You say, you know, that lady sat there for five years and then she didn't have enough PTO or whatever. Sure enough, I had I had had 10 years there at Wells Fargo and I got brought back on. And I was at that time, I was working from home exclusively. I had six to two thirty shift. I had all this stuff and they brought me in. They're like, well, you need to work in the office and and we'll give you the six to two thirty shift. But you're going to have to work in the office for for six months because technically you're no employee. (laughs) What? Yeah. It's like, no, 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 no. So, uh, I don't know. I worked there for about three months and then I ended up applying for another job. 
Yeah. But yeah, I, it's it it's uh it's cr- well. So again, you know, we talk about the 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 path that your career has gone, right? And and you've been a hustler, which you you know a skill you got from your dad, and then you find yourself in this place where they're basically trying to have you start over and discounting your experience when really everything you've gotten uh, out of your career has been the experience that you've made for yourself, right? It's not what what is just about seniority or time. It's because you've hustled, right? right? So you took this now and you, you realized, okay, I'm not being respected based on what I should do. I wasn't respected in the first place when I was let go and I was brought back and still not even though brought back because I pointed out you shouldn't let me go, but you brought me back. And so... You've continued to now take that and evolve that career. So now go ahead and take me from there to where – let's not go to today. Let's go to two weeks ago. Tell me the, tell me the path. Well, there's a little bit more of a story there. So I, I, so I remember I, I applied for this job uh, at, a, at a company downtown. It's a, a management company that I'm with now. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was an IT job. And – Here's here's how I, I sometimes think I don't know either the old man was looking out for me or 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 God or or something. I was supposed to have a, a phone interview, a cell phone interview, and I was supposed to work that day at Wells Fargo. I was supposed mm-hmm. to go in the office because you know of course I was a new employee. I couldn't work from home. <laughs> and uh, not that I'm still bitter about that, but <laughs> so uh, I'm so I called in. I said I can't come to work today. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I was supposed to have this phone interview at about twelve, at about eleven o'clock, and I had my cell phone with me. And pretty soon, my home phone rings, and it's that the the hiring manager at at, at this company I'm at now. And he's yeah. like, for the interview. And I was like, why are you calling my home number? He's like, well, that's the only number I have for you. So I think to myself, man, if I Somehow I had I had car trouble that morning, so I couldn't drive to work. If I had got to work, I would have never got that phone call sure. at home because he didn't have my cell phone number, even though I, I you know. So, anyways, had phone interview. So, I by in. the way, for our, our younger listeners, uh, not having a cell phone, there's this thing called this landline. It was a house phone, like it was wired into your house. We used to have that. Someday, Chris and I are going to explain to you rotary phones, and that that's will right. Blow your mind. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> anyway, so you got called at home instead of on your cell phone. So I, I, I passed the phone interview and uh, I got interviewed uh, in the office. So I went to the office. It was downtown. And I walk into the interview room and there's uh, uh, the head of IT and the VP of marketing and all three mem- all the other two members of the IT team. Sure. And I walk in there and one of those dudes sitting in there that was on the IT team was a guy I used to work with at Wells Fargo. Oh, perfect. and immediately I go, man, was I ever a dick to that guy? <laughs> was, that, <laughs> was that a good thing or a bad and thing? And I was like, that, oh man, that can be a very double edged sword. God, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not a dick to that guy. <laughs> so, uh, go through the man, go through the interview, whatever. Uh, I get, I get offered the job. Mm-hmm. So this is a new, it's basically the same thing. It's, it's, you know, a help desk scenario, but I don't take calls. It's all ticket. It flows into a ticket queue. And Tim, I'm not shitting you. I'm, I'm there three weeks and I'm sitting there at my desk and I'm like, I think, I think I'm doing something wrong because I'm getting through these tickets awful fast. Yeah. You know, like, and there, and, Right. Is, is there like a, like a second sweep through? I should right. Be, like, like missing? am I not logging I, something or it, yeah. Because it just seems too easy, right? Yeah. And I can hear the other pe- the other two guys on the phone, and they're doing their work or whatever. But you know, you'd look at the at the at the queue at the end of the day, and I I worked I don't know thirty five thirty seven tickets, and you know this one guy worked seven, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm like, well, I mean, no, the the boss hasn't come over here and told me what an idiot I am yet, so I'm just yeah. going to keep doing what I'm doing, right? And uh, and sure enough, he. He came over one day and uh, he or he'd sent an email out to the executive team with stats. And in in a 30 day period, I had done, I think, like twenty seven hundred tickets 
and though I beat those guys, those other two guys, three, three combined. Oh, sure. Like, and I was like, and instantly the guy that used to work with me at Wells Fargo, because you know, I at Wells Fargo, it was take a call, take a call, take yeah. a call, take a call. That this guy comes over to me, comes to my desk, he's pissed, <laughs> and he's like, "Hey, you need to fucking knock it off." And I was like, "What?" He's like, "You just, you just need to slow down. You're making us all look bad." And I was like, "So I should not do my job as good as you, yeah, to make you look better? I'm not fucking doing that. Like, no, I no, you know." Yeah. So, anyways, fast forward. I, I, I was never in love with IT. Never. Mm-hmm. I was good at it. I was, I, to, to me, I was always creative, right? That's what hustling is. That's what sure. figuring out how to fix something and, 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 and making your mind work and, and solving problems and all that other stuff. And uh, <clears throat> I could see my career path going down, a, going down a road I did not want to go. I was sitting in a class. Um, I was sitting in a class learning how to program servers. And... Uh, online it was an online class a virtual class which sucks this is yeah. it's those suck and i literally wanted to poke my eyeballs out with an ice pick it sucked so bad i was like i do not want to do this i don't like i'm going to look for another job because i do not want to do this mm-hmm. and so it was it was lunchtime and i walked out of that conference room and i walked right in front of the vp of marketing's office and her name was kelly who interviewed me initially for the with the it job who turns out didn't want to hire me <laughs> <laughs> she tells me that later uh she said uh, hey chris you don't know anybody with an it background that would be interested in a marketing job do you and i said yeah what about me and she goes well what about you i said i'd be interested so we went and had lunch that day and she offered me the job a week later oh nice so i ended, I ended up moving into the market department she's like you know you have it skills i need people that can build websites and design websites and 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 run this this you know, this portal and so on. Uh, I can teach you the design aspects of it. Yep. But the IT portion of it and the, and, and and the background for that is so hard to teach that if you already have that knowledge, I think you're a perfect fit. So, you know, I, that's, I moved over to the marketing department. So imagine that middle age 40, that was five years ago, 44 year old man in a department with all women under 30. (laughs) <laughs> I, I definitely became the old man there yeah uh but no i mean i think that's that's something where again that was you taking a skill that you had never really intended to develop in the first place right and then parlaying that into yet another uh, you know we go back to high school you're thinking you're, you're going to be, you're actually closer to michael j fox now than you were through any other part of your (laughs) career really believe it or not before i had to come work from home i was in a corner with a bunch of windows it was almost (laughs) a corner office i'll tell you it was pretty sweet up there now i'm stuck down here in my basement yeah uh but i was that uh, close to my corner office right right so um you know you've kind of gone through all of that uh I think, first of all, kudos to you for having the savvy to take advantage of the need at the time. I think one of the the things that, uh, you know, I'll admit myself, I'm struggling right now is trying to figure out what is the need that I can go do. You know, I spend time developing new skills and trying to put more things in my toolbox and all of that. But, uh, you know, you took advantage of a need at your dad's business and turned that into something. You took advantage of a need that happened at this company that kind of got presented to you, and you found a way to make that work, right? Uh, so that again, that kind of goes back to that hustle. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna talk about kind of what what has happened to you more recently because you you talked at, at the top of the show about even more uh, career changes here recently. Uh, but I kind of want to get back to that idea of the hustle. Uh, you said, you said in the last episode, you said multiple times today that your dad was a hustler. Your dad took advantage of, of these situations, whether that was a flea market or some guy unloading computers or whatever, he took advantage of those. And I think that's a skill that you, you got, um, when you're, when 
you guys parted away with the the tech expert at your dad's shop and you said hey dad i'm going to take this over uh and your dad was support- what do you think was going through your dad's mind when that happened he's well, i think he's, he's seen what you've gone through in in college and how you've gotten here what do you think was going through your dad's mind uh he gave you the thumbs up but what do you think was going through his mind i i think that he i think part of him thought that i wasn't capable sure because you base people based off the you, you judge people based off of their history, right? Yeah. yeah. I, I I quit a lot of things when I was in high school. I quit football. I quit wrestling. Uh, I I you know came back from school with my tail between my legs. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I just grew older, and I think he was nervous. But I think at that point too, I was the only port in a storm too, right? Sure. He didn't have anywhere else. He didn't have anything else to do. And it was still a viable business. Yep. Um, so, and I think that he, a part of him too was proud that I was willing to stick it out with him. Yep. You know what I mean? Sure. Sure. Uh, so we rolled up our sleeves and uh, it wasn't easy. Um, but you figure it out and you sometimes you're like man i and at one point you know within six months i'm i I got four machines on on the bench all running diagnostics all at the same time and 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 installing this and setting this new one up and repairing this one and and things like that to to the point where it wasn't even a second thought that we didn't have somebody else now we at that point we got so busy we ended up hiring another technician but at that point it was something that i could oversee and 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 knew more about right so sure. as opposed to putting all of our all of our faith in this one kid that had worked there before that we just always assumed would be honest and he wasn't he wasn't so so um this is where i'm gonna go uh psychoanalysis on this i'm gonna i'm gonna get a little deep here that's right uh, what did you learn from your dad in that moment? And I'm not even going to get into uh, that that made you a better dad because I, I, I happen to know for a fact you're a fantastic dad. Uh, but what did you learn from your dad about leading people in that moment? Because I feel like that was probably a pretty, whether or not you've, you've said that overtly but i feel like that was a a kind of a pivotal moment that your dad had a thing where you've said he questioned you um but he didn't outwardly question you he didn't say no chris you can't do this right so what did you learn from your dad about leading and managing people and empowering them so that's that's question one and then part two of that is and how have you carried that forward throughout your career well I will, I will tell you, he always used to say to me, uh, actions speak louder than words. Mm-hmm. That was always his, his mantra. And as much as my kids hated me saying it all the time, doing the easy thing isn't always right. And doing the right thing isn't always the easiest. Yeah, for sure. And he epitomized showing what was right it didn't matter what somebody said it didn't matter what their actions you, you knew who a person was based off their actions mm-hmm. and that was kind of how i was from the minute i walked into that house and told him that i had that i had i had screwed up in school i had i had made a conscious decision that i was going to show him mm-hmm. that that wasn't going to happen again ever mm-hmm. And that I was going to prove to myself that I didn't need anybody and I could do it on my own, right? Yep. And the only way you can do that, you can sit there and say that all day long. But you need to prove it yeah. by your actions. So I was, either going to, I was either going to succeed or fail back there. But I certainly wasn't going to not try because not trying doesn't work. Yeah. That does not work. Uh, you, you've already given up at that point. And I just do not. I, I'm not a quitter. Never yeah. have been. N- not since then. Um, so that was that was part of it. And 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 going forward, 
I, I try to teach my kids that. Mm -hmm. And I, and I'll not, some people know, but I don't know that you know this, but you know, three years ago, as a matter of fact, what's the date today? It's 16th. Yes. Three years ago on the 20th, which was my wife's birthday. Uh, I woke up one morning and passed out three times and, and got rushed to the hospital and they found cancer in my esophagus. And uh, my Caitlin was a senior in high school. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the boys were just beginning high school. And I, uh, I remember sitting in that room crying because I didn't know what I was going to do. And I gave myself about a half an hour mm-hmm. of feeling sorry for myself. And I was like, okay, well, there's enough of that bullshit. We're moving on. And so I about a I used to go to chemo on Monday more on Mondays. I'd go to chemo on Mondays and I'd go to radiation every day. Never missed a day of work in the office. Worked every single day. Because I was not gonna let I was not gonna let that beat me. Yep. Um and and I owed my company and and, and the people I worked with everything that I had. Sure. I was it was it was and that was that was my dad. That was Melvin. You were not ever going to be able to say to, to somebody he didn't do his hundred percent. It just was not ever going to be an option for me. Mm-hmm. And I remember uh, I was sitting there one night, and uh, I was it was I don't know. Stacy was asleep, and 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 Caitlin came upstairs, and she was sitting in the middle of the floor, and she was crying. And I said, "What are you crying for?" And she was, "I just don't understand why it happened to you. It's not fair." It shouldn't happen to you. And I was like, stop. We're not playing that anymore. We're not, Mm -hmm. we're not going down that road. I, we're not even going to entertain it. And I had just watched this motivational. I found this YouTube video. It's about six and a half minutes long. And it's called uh, why we fail. Why do we fail? And it had this opening mantra in it from uh, the Rocky Balboa movie where he's talking to his kid about his kid was telling about how unfair his life was. And he and and he I, he said, man, it just spoke to me, and it was right what my dad would say. And it was it just fit right into the wheelhouse of how I just tackle every single thing, every obstacle I have. Was he said, life can knock you into the street and beat you and keep you there permanently if you let it. Uh, you or anybody else isn't ever going to hit you as hard as life does, and you can either lay down in the street and take the beating, or you can get up and you can move forward. And that's how you win. And that's what I told Caitlin that night. I'm not laying in the street taking a beating. And we're not going to feel sorry for ourselves. This isn't the year that dad got cancer. This is the year that you're going to graduate. This is the year that the boys start high school. We're not playing that. And that's how I kind of have lived my life the last Mm -hmm. few years is just with that no quit mentality. And it goes, yep. it goes back from those seven years that I worked alongside my dad and watched him claw and fight for everything that he had mm-hmm. and make mistakes. Mm-hmm. I mean, he made a lot of mistakes at the end that cost him his business. Sure. And, and I, and he was a broken man at the end of it. And that's a, and you know what? That's another motivating factor. Right. I'll I'll never I will never ever ever let my kids see that. Sure. Um I you know I do say cuz you had mentioned before that your dad had expressed his disappointment in you back in college. Um I think the thing that is admirable about what your dad did and I think probably <laughs> I think uh, without diving in too deep, since I didn't know the man, but you know he feels defeated. He felt defeated by his his mistakes. Um, he didn't let you be defeated by your mistakes, mm-hmm. and he and he gave you, despite saying, "Hey, you know, it's disappointing that you did this. I'm disappointed." He still gave you the opportunity, and then when. When there came a time where the business was struggling and it required you to buckle down and learn a new skill, you know, he was probably scared shitless that you were going to have to do this, but he gave you that opportunity. And I think there's, there's, there's a 
there's a selflessness in all of that that I can see that you carry through. And when you tell the story about what you were going through with your, your cancer diagnosis is that you were being a leader for your family, for your, for your wife, for your kids. And you're right. This sucks and it's disappointing. But we, we can't dwell on what is wrong. We need to focus on the opportunity that's there. So the opportunity to get better, the opportunity to, to do something different. Uh, and I, I, and, and Chris, I, I can tell you, uh, every time I talk to you that that shines right through. Um, so uh, thank you by the way, for, for sharing, for sharing that, that story. That's something we haven't talked about. And, and I appreciate that. Listen, that's, uh, <clears throat> you know, not to be too personal, but there, there were a lot of times, well, Every single day that I, I laid on that table with radiation, uh, there was a there was a, a little bit of a I said <laughs> I said a hail mary, I said a glory be. I asked that God point the the machines in the right direction and to help the nurses and doctors. Mm -hmm. And if He did that, then I would always promise to to honor Him by telling everybody what He did for me. And that's part of this podcast and part mm -hmm. of this journey that I'm, I'm, I'm giving and I'm an open book. And, you know, it's funny that you say opportunity. Um, when, when things kind of changed around here at work, uh, this last week, mm -hmm. uh, somebody was talking to me and I, well, my new supervisor, I said, I can do one of two things. I can feel sorry for myself, or I can look at this as a, is a, is a brand new opportunity to, to, to expand my horizons and to expand my job uh, abilities and to learn even more. And that's how I'm going to tackle that. Yeah. You know? So let's, let's, let's dive into that a little bit more because you had a, um, what I would say is an Oh shit moment here at work. Yeah. Where very recently you, you posted like a, Oh God, what, what what now what what is happening right, right? so so tell me a little bit more kind of about uh you know you you had kind of shared with me but share with people yeah. as much as you're comfortable like what no, is, what has changed and and uh and now because you know again we're we're tying this all the way back to the dude who watched the secret of my success back right? in 1988 now to 2000 I would like to point out <laughs> that I am technically in advertising. So really I did, <laughs> I did get, I did meet that goal. Um, all circles, all circles. All circles. Uh, <laughs> you know, five years ago, and this happened on the five year anniversary that I accepted this job uh, wow. it, with the marketing department. And, you know, like I said, in, in a group with, with uh, very talented, very smart uh, women, all under 30 that, Watch this middle-aged man who didn't know anything about a vector file or Photoshop <laughs> or what an InDesign was or what a what a font was or AI I had no AI idea what a hex color was. I you know whatever. Um, and my boss took a chance on me, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, and I grew into that job, and I, I and I've gotten some extremely good friends uh, on that team. Uh, women that I admire and that I have a lot of fun with. And, uh, I kind of protect a little bit, right. Sure. I kind of feel like I'm their dad, you know, sure. Sure. uh, there are plenty of times where there's conversations there where they go, Chris, you don't really have anything to add to this because they're talking about, you know, dresses and color palettes and whatever else. And I still give them my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> we First argue. All, I'm, I'm more of a pencil skirt guy. Right. So. We yeah. had an entire, I, I don't know, <laughs> me and this girl, Elizabeth, had probably a four day argument about what a duvet was and how stupid it was. And, <laughs> and, and how nobody in their right mind really needs a duvet. And there's, there's, there's and I stand by my yeah, argument. What's the difference between a duvet and a duvet cover? Because right. you sometimes hear that. And I'm, I, I think, isn't a duvet what a duvet cover? It, it's like chai tea. Is it is it redundant? I I don't know. It's a fancy pillowcase. That's what it is. It's a fancy pillowcase. That's yeah, what it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this this is why you have a bunch of grumpy old white men hosting a podcast, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it's for us to complain about fancy pillowcases. <laughs> that's right. So <laughs> so uh, you know, uh, last week um, I was heading to the gym, and uh, 
I got a meeting invite for the next morning at 930 in the morning that just said team catch up. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, maybe it's a after work half the hour or whatever else. And I went and looked and nope, it's at 930 in the morning. And I was like, well, that's kind of weird. It's not a very so, happy right. So then I, I get a, uh, a, I pull into the gym. I get a call um, from a uh, very nice lady uh, who works in the Dallas office uh, who uh, told me that they had done some uh, changes within the marketing department and that my boss was no longer there. Who was this, I had, was it the boss that brought you in? Yes, brought me yeah. in. And, and you know, I, I've gotten to be very good friends with her. Sure. Uh, I consider her a mentor. Uh, she is probably one of the smartest people that I've ever met. Um, mm -hmm. She could uh, talk art and music and any of the fine arts and still sit there and play poker and drink the best beer and take all your money and talk about how <laughs> she could gut a deer. Right. I mean, right. she was. Right. Right. So. <clears throat> um. And we had a lot in common. I think her parents and my parents were a lot alike. And we all, you know, we, we grew up in a different era and, and, um, I was sad to see her go because yeah. she did a lot for me. Uh, uh, this, the, the lady that had called me was very nice and very, you know, uh, explained to me that I was, uh, there was no other changes that was happening. Um, but as I was talking to her, I was like, so does that mean I'm, not part of the marketing department because I was going to start reporting to her and she's in a different department. Mm -hmm. And she assured me that all my job duties were going to be the same, that there was nothing going to change with that. Yep. Um, but I was a little saddened because I was not going to be part of that team. Yeah, for sure. Um, so in the meeting the next morning, uh, I had, um, we had some discussions and, you know, I had, I had a little bit of a flashback of that interview that I had back for Wells Fargo. I thought, you know, mm -hmm. 49 years old, I'm just going to say what I want to say and be honest. Sure. And if I'm an honest with my feelings and honest about how things are, nothing should be wrong with that. And I said to, to the entire group, I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to lie that I'm not sad that I'm not part of this team anymore because those people on that team work very hard and they did a lot for me. And there's no way I'd be in my career where I am now without those people and without that lady that gave him that took a chance on me. Yeah. I said, and I got a little emotional and I said, um, this company's done a lot for me and they have, I, uh, you know, I, I want to make sure it's quite clear that this company is the best company I've ever worked for. And I would, I would do anything in the world for them because they did a lot for me when I was sick, but I also did a lot when I was sick for them. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that those things are remembered. Mm -hmm. So, uh, afterwards, my new boss uh, messaged me, who I've had a good working relationship, you know, on the fringes. I, uh, I, I said, I, so you'd kind of know her. Already. Yes, uh, okay. we it, our our areas touch a little bit, and she's explained to me that um, I'm going to be more of a hybrid between those two departments now. Uh, mm -hmm. That my job duties and everything won't change, and that um, you know, it was nice to hear. She said, "I I think that you go pretty unnoticed over there." Mm -hmm. and that you um <clears throat> i chose you to be on this team for a reason sure and uh and that i hope that you um and, and and i told her that's when i said i can either be scared and and or i can see this as an opportunity to learn even more and to show you that you made the right choice yeah. I, I, so when when you told me that this all went down uh, the other day, uh, I think that was the first thing I asked you. Is, is I think I said, "Yeah, I'm sorry you're going through this, but does this provide you with an opportunity?" Yeah. Uh, right. And, and I think as we've talked tonight, you're someone who uh, capitalizes on, on opportunity. So now that you've had some some time to process this, you told me at the time that that yeah, you think this is an opportunity. But now you've you've had some time to process this. Uh, how are you feeling? I feel good. I feel I feel really good. Um, uh, as I said, a couple of the of the new team members have reached out to me and told me how excited they are to work with me. Mm -hmm. um, that they know what my work ethic is. Uh, made kind of a boneheaded. Something happened yesterday that was a little bit out of my control, but I, it's still in my area, and I felt I felt pretty sick about it last night. 
Sure. And I messaged my new boss this morning. I said, I'm two days in and I've already, I've already screwed up. So I was, I'm ruining your track record over there. She, goes, <laughs> she said, luckily I know about your good work ethic. So don't worry about it. Oh, but, uh, and you know, I'm, I'm still really good. Uh, I'm still in good contact with the, uh, with the other people uh, that I work with. And it, it's, to me, it's just all, it's all going to work out. I, sure. I learned a, a long time ago to not worry about the things that I can't control. And the only thing that I can control is that I come in here every day and I give the best I can to the company that I work for and that I do my best job. And at the end of the day, if that's not going to work, then like my dad used to say, you can't ever come and say that he didn't give us all. Yeah. And that's really the bottom line for anything. If mm -hmm. anybody takes anything out of, out of this, I tell my kids to this day, if you're doing the right thing and you know in your heart you're doing right and being a good person, then it doesn't matter what anybody else says about you because you and your heart know the truth. And that's really all that matters. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, Chris, I, I actually think that is a very good bow to kind of put on this episode, right? We Every time we launch this thing, every time, this is our second, but when we talk about this, uh, what we say is at the end of the day, we want to make sure that the experiences that we've gone through can help encourage, guide, direct, correct uh, whatever. Sometimes we're going to be grumpy about this stuff. Sometimes we're going to feel lament that things aren't about the past uh, or aren't as good as they were in the past or that things have changed. But I think ultimately, um, uh, I know this, you know this, we have not gone through everything uh, the right way at all times. Uh, we have not always gone through things certainly the way that we had planned i think you've kind of laid that out uh from from secret of my success to law school uh to yeah to jimmy smith's so, from michael j fox <laughs> to jimmy smith's to uh God, I, I threw some know. Denzel Washington in there too. Oh, there was know? Denzel Washington. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know who you would be right now. What your job would be right now? Oh uh, man, I don't know. Boy, that's that's a whole nother. I don't know, but I would imagine all my friends that are listening to this will probably message me and tell me you're totally this guy, and yeah. I'll be a loser. I'm sure that's what it'll be. <laughs> no, that's that's uh, that's that's cool. You can be Dwight Schrute. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do think that was a really good bow to kind of put on that, that as we look at, uh, so again, you have, uh, boys in high school, you have a, you have a daughter in college, you have, uh, uh, kids and other, just other people around you that you're trying to help, uh, understand what their future is. And I think one thing that's been big and impressed upon me over the last week is uh it's good to have an idea of what the future holds it's more important to be adaptable to what the future brings right and so Absolutely. you you've talked about taking advantage of opportunities working hard being a person of integrity and all the other things falling into place, right? I think that's kind of a, a big key, and I don't know. It sounds, you know, almost kind of pithy, like something you could put on a bumper sticker or whatever, but I think the reality is um, uh, acquiring new skills and being adaptable uh, and being able to work with people is way more important than having a good career mindset and going forward. There are certain people that... You know, they know from age eight on what they're going to do and they get single minded focused and they can get there in certain careers. That's probably beneficial. Uh, but for the vast majority of us being adaptable and understanding that that job that you didn't even you didn't even know in 1988 that a job like you have today would even exist. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's no way you could plan for that. But the reason why you're successful, the reason why you're a good leader and a good partner and an asset to the company that you're at that they're willing to say okay you know what i know your track record uh 
let's move forward with this is because of of those skills. And so, Chris, I appreciate you sharing that that story. Is there kind of anything else you want to say to summarize this to turn a neat little <clears throat> finish or or, uh, or? You know, I I'll just I'll just say this. I said it because uh, my anniversary of getting sick is coming up here in a few days. Three years ago, um, a lot of people would say when I got sick that that was a sh- that was a really shitty year, mm-hmm. and I always look back at that as a year that I was learned that I was pretty blessed. Mm-hmm. I was blessed with a with a wonderful family. I was blessed with a wonderful company that I worked for that took care of me uh, and coworkers. Um, I was blessed with a lot of friends that showed me how important I was to them. And I'm blessed today by the opportunity that I have with this new position and this new opportunity and pretty blessed to have people that uh, have a lot of faith in me and my new bosses. That's how you look at things. You look at the good stuff. My mom once told me, I don't talk about my mom a lot, but I once remember bitching and moaning about, I don't know, something. And she said, you don't have it near as bad as somebody else, so you should probably remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, shoot, Chris, this this is supposed to be about us being grumpy old men, and all I have gotten is this good, positive, uplifting... (sighs) I tried to tell you we could have talked about the Ohio State game. Trust me, that would have been two (laughs) hours of me bitching and moaning about them scoring with... 10 seconds left and we don't know what the f- we're doing at the beginning of the game. I almost had a stroke on set on Sunday when the bears almost blew that whole game. And then all of a sudden, Mr. Trubisky looks like the second coming of Jesus. I mean, yeah, hey, I mean, I got a whole plethora of shit I could bitch about. You could, you could, you could be a Vikings fan like me and understand that an offensive line is apparently <laughs> just optional. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, um, well, again, uh, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, this has been Old Man Strength. Once again, uh, I am Tim Johnson, joined by Chris Shipley. You have been enjoying a podcast of the Tailgate Society. And please visit our sponsor online at deadibbq.com. Until next time, we will see you later. I don't want to get on the bandwagon. I'll burn that wagon down and join the band. Traveling troubadours terrorizing street corners Just to try to get some supper in our hands Now I waited all my life to get this off my chest Green buddy murder until someone understands That it ain't about the money, the drugs, or the women I make this noise just because I can And we'll all join in To that original sin